Hey, welcome back to Understanding Gradle. Today I would like to talk about working and aggregating custom artifacts. With that I mean files and formation you have in your build or you produce by your build that you wanna put together in the end as part of your distribution or as additional information like Java doc or code coverage reports that you create on your CI system. This is a topic you need to deal with at the end of the build pipeline where you want to collect certain information that you want to make available for other developers, your customers or your users. The main things here work out of the box because they are configured by plugins, like the application plugin that allows you to package a distribution with all your jars to ship as a final application. But it is quite common that you want to do more customization in this area. In the end, this is about assembling your final product. Gradle offers a rich set of features to deal with this topic. However, to use them correctly, you need to understand a little bit more about how the dependency management works under the hood. And that's what we are going to look at today. To get started, let's look at an example I used in an earlier video, where we configured our own zip task to build a custom distribution setup. So this example already touched the topic we talk about today. In this example, we used the runtime class path, which is a resolvable configuration provided and pre-configured by the Java plugins. It gives us all the jars of the dependency of our project, the app project in our case, and the transitive dependencies of these dependencies. Because that is what we need and want to package into our application, all the jars that are required at runtime. So let's imagine that we also want to ship the Java doc for all our library code. Gradle already offers a Java doc task that calls the Java doc tool to extract the Java doc from the source code and render it. However, in the standard setup, this task is configured per project and builds the Java doc for each project individually. But what we want is one aggregated Java doc for all our library source code. So what we can do is register another Java doc task, let's call it full Java doc. We need to configure it with two inputs. The first thing are also compiled classes. To do that, we can just use the runtime class pass again as we did in the zip task above. The second thing, however, is all the source code, because the Java tool needs to look into it to extract the Java doc comments. So we would need something like a sources path, which would give us all the source code of all our projects. Unlike the runtime class path, this is not available, unfortunately, but we can create it ourselves. For that, we create a new configuration and make it resolvable. We've already done something similar to achieve consistent resolution with our application, which I talked about in the video about dependency version conflicts. And I've also explained the concept of a resolvable configuration in the declaring dependency video a bit more. Now, when Gradle solves this configuration, we also wanted to look into all the transitive dependencies we've already declared as implementation or API dependencies. So we can tell Gradle to reuse the dependencies we've already declared by extending our new configuration from the implementation configuration, which is used to declare dependencies and through the setup done by the Java library plugin, this also includes API dependencies. I've shown and talked about the setup in the video on declaring dependencies. Now, we also need to set an attribute on the configuration to distinguish our new sources path from the runtime class path or the compile class path. I'll talk about attributes a bit more after we went through the whole example. Usually, if you do such a setup for the sake of your own build and not in plugins you share or something like that, it is sufficient to set the usage attribute to a custom value. So we set the usage attribute to Java sources. In the compile class path, this is set to Java API and on the runtime class path, this is set to Java runtime, just to give you an idea about the differences here. So if we ask Gradle now, to build us our full Java doc, it will give us an error that it can't find the Java sources variant in our other projects. This is because in contrast to the classes or the jar files, the source code is not made visible or exported by the other projects. Making certain artifacts and dependencies visible as one thing I can use in a consumer is called a variant in Gradle. Or technically, a consumable configuration, which we've also talked a little bit before in other videos. So in this case, the consumable configuration or the variant that provides the source code is missing from all our projects. Of course, 
we can also add that. Because this is something we want in all our projects, we go to our Java base plugin and add it there. Again, we create a configuration, but this time we set it to consumable. Then we also set the usage attribute to Java sources, so that the thing we want to use and the thing we request match up. Again, we say the configuration should extend from the implementation configuration, so that when we resolve the sources path, all the dependencies of our projects are also considered as transitive dependencies. And then of course the most important part is to tell Gradle that this variant or this consumable configuration should provide us with the source code. The source code is located in the source folders, which we can access through the main source set. Using the outgoing artifact notation, we tell Gradle that these are artifacts of this variant or this consumable configuration that provides us Java sources. If we ask Gradle now to build us a full Java doc, we get a different error. What we did so far worked, but now because we're looking into all the transitive dependencies, Gradle also looks for the source code in the external dependencies. Of course, there is no source code there. It could be there in packaged form, but we also don't want that. We only want the source code of our own projects to generate the Java doc for our own source code. One way to avoid this would be to do a different dependency setup in all our projects. So instead of extending from the implementation configuration, we could directly define dependencies to the projects from which we want to aggregate information. It would be more effort to maintain a different set of dependency declarations for this, but in certain cases it's a better solution. There's another tool Gradle offers us that we can use here, which are artifact views. You can think of artifact views as something that's put on top of a resolvable configuration in places where you use it. One thing artifact views allow you is to set them to a lenient mode, which means they'll just ignore errors during dependency resolution. We can do this here and now our Java doc task is successful. Please note that you have to be a bit careful with this lenient mode as unfortunately it ignores all the errors. So if there are other problems with your setup, you might not see them once you activated it. So if something is not working, a good step is always to deactivate it to analyze the error before you turn it back on. We can see now that a full Java doc was generated that includes Java doc for all the sources of our library subprojects. Now, we only looked at one example of aggregating information. Depending on what you want to do, there's a lot of individual details here to consider. So let's have a closer look how the so-called variant selection works during dependency resolution in Gradle. In the videos about dependency version conflicts and capability conflicts, we learned that Gradle can select different components if there's a conflict. For example, if there are two versions of the same components available, Gradle will select one. But the component selection is only the first step of the dependency resolution. Afterwards, Gradle selects a variant inside the component. Each component can have arbitrary many variants. In the Java world, by default, a component has two variants, the API variant and the runtime variant. If the component is a local Gradle subproject, these variants are represented by the API elements and the runtime elements consumable configurations. In published components, these variants are also available. They are also called API elements and runtime elements usually, and this information is present in the Gradle metadata files. Now each variant may hold an arbitrary number of artifacts. In the Java case, usually both variants have the jar file. Usually it's the same one. Then each variant may have dependencies to other components. These are different. The runtime variant has all the dependencies, so the ones you declared as implementation and API, while the API variant, which is used at compile time, only has the API dependencies. To identify a variant, each variant has one or several attributes. The kind of main attribute is the usage attribute, which we just used in the example. In the case of Java library, there are also a number of other attributes. For example, one that represents the Java version with which the jar is compatible. This allows you, for example, to have two API and two runtime variants for different Java versions. Now, when we resolve dependencies through a resolvable configuration, like the runtime class path, the resolvable configuration also has attributes attached, saying which variants it wants to match. So in the case of the runtime class path, the usage attribute is set to Java runtime, and then through the whole dependency graph, these variants are matched. As you can see, the attribute is not only important for the direct dependencies, 
but also for all transitive dependencies, which is the key feature of this variant-aware matching mechanism. So if we change to the compile class pass, Gradle will resolve the compile class pass variants. In this case, this will exclude some of the components completely from the dependency graph. Now for the Java doc, we also needed the sources pass, where we introduced a new value for the usage attribute called Java sources. Now, when Gradle tried to match it, we got an error because there is no variant with this attribute available. What we did then is adding this variant to all our local projects by introducing a consumable configuration that carries this attribute. Afterwards, Gradle was able to match these variants. Only for the external components that were published, the variant wasn't available, which in our case was okay, so we just ignored this error. Looking at this, always keep in mind that this is only an example. Also, the variants for the Java libraries are provided by the Java library plugin. And with Gradle Metadata, you can also publish arbitrary many variants. So if you indeed, for example, develop a Java library where you have jars for different Java versions, you can publish several jars which are still available as one component under one set of coordinates. As you've seen, Gradle is very powerful when it comes to customizing the aggregation of artifacts from different places. However, it's also hard to get into sometimes, and depending on your use case, it might be really difficult to figure out the right combination of things. I hope that this video can still help you to get your custom use cases addressed. But if you have questions, please post them in the comments. Please also share your use case if you like. I might do a follow-up video showing how different use cases are solved with these concepts. As always, there's also a link to the example on GitHub, so you can try things out yourself. Please also consider subscribing to this channel. See you next time.